In this video, we're going to throw heteroatoms into the mix of conjugated systems, and heteroatom substituted conjugated systems are hugely important. Aromatic heterocycles, reactive intermediates, we'll see like enols and enamines, we'll see these structures again, and recognizing a conjugated system involving a heteroatom is going to be really important. And a good place to start here is recognizing that any atom that bears an unhybridized p orbital, any atom that is sp2 or sp hybridized, can participate in conjugation. This includes heteroatoms that bear lone pairs. If those lone pairs can occupy p orbitals and be delocalized into adjacent p orbitals, they will do so. Carbanions, which, like those heteroatoms bearing lone pairs, have lone pairs themselves on the, the anionic carbon, and even trigonal carbocations, which have sp2 hybridization and a p orbital that's empty but nonetheless can still overlap with adjacent p orbitals. So all of these structural elements can participate in conjugation. And on the right here, I've listed out in figure form, in structural form, the structural elements of delocalized pi systems. Double bonds, we've already seen those. Triple bonds can participate just as well in conjugation. Heteroatoms that are not already engaged in a double bond. This lone pair can delocalize itself, and we'll see what that looks like with these examples here in a second. Carbanions, where that lone pair can occupy a p orbital, and carbocations that are trigonal but have an unhybridized p orbital on the cationic carbon. These five structural elements are the basic building blocks of any conjugated system. When we string these together, three of them, three atoms or more, we've got a delocalized pi or conjugated system on our hands. And as a consequence of this string together, and again, we'll see this in these examples, at least one significant alternative resonance form can be drawn for a conjugated system. Conjugation and resonance go hand in hand, and this is really important to keep in mind. So now what I want to do is look at four examples of conjugated systems, delocalized pi systems, containing, pi, uh, containing heteroatoms. All right, let's take a look first at this example. So we have an oxygen. That oxygen bears two lone pairs, and that oxygen is adjacent to a double bond. So we can think about delocalization of this lone pair associated with the pi bond of the alkene that I've highlighted in blue, in a sense. And we can also generate a resonance form of this molecule by pushing the lone pair on oxygen into a pi bond. This, in essence, shows the delocalization, right? Shows that this pair of electrons is actually engaged in pi bonding with the carbon next door. At the same time, to satisfy the octet rule and keep formal charge happy and all that good stuff, we can push the pi electrons here onto this carbon. And this leads to a resonance structure that, again, really shows that that lone pair on oxygen that we pushed in is engaged in pi bonding. There's a pi bond in this alternative resonance form that is a very real phenomenon. There is actually double bond character between that carbon and oxygen. This also shows that the carbon here is partially negative, has some nucleophilic character. We're going to come back to that when we start applying conjugated systems in reactions. So that's our first example. Kind of a similar thing going on in this second case. Now we have a nitrogen that has a lone pair, and it's again adjacent to a double bond. Here it's a carbon-oxygen double bond. So we can think of this lone pair as a kind of electron source for resonance. The, these CO pi electrons is a kind of electron sink where those electrons would actually be really happy to land on the electronegative oxygen atom and push electrons like this to generate a resonance form of this molecule that shows that, in fact, that lone pair on nitrogen is actually delocalized and engaged in pi bonding with the carbon next door. There's quite a bit of double bond character between carbon and nitrogen in this molecule, and this alternative resonance form really shows it pretty clearly. This is a functional group known as an amide, and we're going to come back to amides in a big way later in the course. So this is yet another exam example of resonance, and the atoms that we've highlighted in, in blue and red here, the nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen, are part of a three-atom delocalized pi system or conjugated system. In this third case, we once again have a nitrogen that bears a lone pair. That looks like a great electron source and we can engage that electron source in resonance because it's next door to a carbon-carbon pi bond. 
So we've got good electron source in the lone pair, good electron sink in the pi bond next door, and we can flow electrons like this. We can flow electrons like so to create a resonance form of this structure. And in that resonance form, we now have a carbon-nitrogen double bond. Notice again, there's actually double bond character between that carbon and, and nitrogen. It is not a plain vanilla sigma bond. There's positive charge on the nitrogen now, at least formally in this resonance structure. Now there's negative charge on the carbon down here, and that's our resonance structure. So once again, we've shown that this lone pair is actually not localized on nitrogen, but delocalized and engaged in pi bonding with the carbon next door. Finally, we have benzene, and I wanted to highlight benzene because it's an example where we have two neutral resonance forms, and we can interconvert or, or change one resonance form into another just by shifting the pi electrons. So we could think of, for example, this double bond as a source of pi electrons and the double bonds in the other positions as a kind of sink. And what we're going to end up doing is cyclic electron flow at the end of the day. And so we highlight these in purple actually to, to show this, that if we start flowing the pi electrons this way, we can continue pushing pi electrons around and generate an alternative resonance form that's actually still neutral at every atom, but has the double bonds in different positions. And this is a distinct structure from what we started with, and it shows that these electrons we've highlighted in purple, the pi electrons, are really delocalized over all six carbons in benzene. We'll come back to benzene in a big way later in the course, but that's a very important example of, of resonance in a conjugated system. The last point I want to make before we leave this slide is about how we know a lone pair is conjugated or part of a conjugated system or not. And you'll probably be asking yourself this question a lot, particularly if your kind of spidey senses are tingling that resonance or conjugation is relevant to a molecule that you've drawn or, or seen. And the big idea here is if a lone pair can occupy a p orbital and delocalize with a p orbital next door, overlap with a p orbital next door, then it will do so. So for example here, this oxygen, because it has a double bond next door, that this carbon is sp2 hybridized and has a p orbital engaged in pi bonding, and this oxygen has a lone pair that could occupy a p orbital, that lone pair will occupy a p orbital because that creates additional bonding, right? That creates delocalization of the electrons, which is a stabilizing effect. We saw that in earlier discussions of conjugated dienes, and it holds true more generally. Conjugated systems are more stable than localized electron type of systems where resonance, for example, is, is not in play. Resonance is, is irrelevant. So when a lone pair can occupy a p orbital and delocalize like this, it will do so. Now, not all lone pairs can do this. For example, after we've delocalized one lone pair, well, we've essentially used up the unhybridized p orbital at that oxygen, and it's not possible for this other lone pair to delocalize as well. There's already a pi bond there, right? And when there's already a pi bond there, that atom's already engaged in pi bonding, and any remaining lone pairs cannot participate in conjugation. So two electrons on one atom is essentially the maximum we could throw into a conjugated system.